The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good, after, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Automating Your Design Through Manufacturing Process, Using a Suite of Tools in Creo for uh, NC and Tool Design. My name is Rob Romanoski. I'm the Director of Sales Operations with 3HTI. And with us today uh, is Lee Goodwin, a... Um, uh, who's been with PTC for 24 years and uh, is going to be leading us today in a demonstration of the uh, Creo NC and Tool Design Suite, as well as a brief overview at the end. We also have Jim Gilmore, who uh, has been with PTC about the same, or actually with 3HTI and started with PTC about 24 years ago, um, very knowledgeable in the area of uh, manufacturing so we're great to have these guys on our panel today, as well as Joe DiCarlo of 3HTI as well, who also uh, has a long tenured experience uh, in the processes of manufacturing and Creo NC tool design. So everyone's going to be on mute throughout the webinar. And uh, if you have any questions, please type those into the dashboard and we will answer those questions at the end. So right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Jim do a uh, – Jim wants to do a quick intro about what we're going to see today, and then I'm going to pass everything over to uh, Mr. Lee Goodwin. Hi, everybody. Um, you know, I, I asked Rob and Lee to uh, assist in setting up this webinar today because I think a lot of the excitement in Creo seems to focus on the engineering and the design side and all the new enhancements there, but – what most people don't realize is there's more development in Creo manufacturing, and that's what I call it, the complete machining, production machining, prismatic milling, or prismatic, yeah, prismatic milling, um, and NC sheet metal, um, more development in those modules in the past three releases than in the previous 12 combined. And what that means for you as a customer or potential customer is automation. So you can take files in from Creo. If you're in Creo, you don't take them in. You just machine right on your native parts. If you're bringing parts in as a machine shop uh, from different softwares, you can bring in Step, IGIS. You can actually bring in STL files and machine them. Most people don't know that Creo can machine STL files. But you can bring in from any SolidWorks, Katia, NX, um, Inventor, and machine them. And then as changes come in from the original file, your tool pass update automatically. So that's the big thing with Creo is automation, automation, automation from start to finish. And uh, I, I believe it's a very, very neglected module um, from the public or from the, the general population because not too many people know about it, know what it can do and know what it can do for them and their business. So without further ado, Lee, take it away. Alrighty, thanks, Jim. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. So, Lee, you should have control now. Yep. Let me share my screen, and let me know, uh, Rob, when you see that. I do. Okay. Well, let's get going then. So, welcome everybody. Yeah. Again, my name is Lee Goodwin. I'm out of Colorado, PTC, and let's take a look at. Creo and Creo manufacturing here. So um, as always, start with a part. Uh, this is a Creo model, uh, just a typical one. Um, I'm actually going to be running Creo 5, which came out Monday. So a little, little risky here, you know, brand new model, but I think we'll be all right. Um, either way, I'll talk about what's new in the latest revs as I go through this to give you an idea of where we're going with this. But otherwise, this is just a Creo model. So let's go make a tool path. Let's go build this thing. The first thing I do is I say new, but instead of part or assembly drawing, I say manufacturing, right? So this is the time to start up a chain. So let's give it a name. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab a template. So uh, everything I do in Creo NC is gonna be all about reuse. If I've done it once, then I can do it over and over a bunch of times. And that's part of how your automation gets going. So in this case, you know, I've got, I programmed a model on my Haas mill. I brought in a Kurt Weiss and so forth. So let's reuse that, right? So now I'm in Creo NC. So if you've never seen this before, you'll notice the first thing is it's Creo. You know, I've got my model tree. I've got my parts and so forth. 
just like you're used to. And I've got the ribbon interface. So if you haven't seen Creo NC in a while, um, this is pretty different, but in the old pro engineer uh, manufacturing days, you got a ribbon interface. The difference because this is a manufacturing one is I've got a manufacturing tab and all the different things that need to happen to make that go. So basically I'm gonna start this up. I wanna start a, go get my model, right? So what am I gonna machine? Well, I'm gonna go get that part. And notice what didn't happen. There's no translation, there's no IGEST, there's no anything because all I'm doing is assembling my component into my fixture, right? So then I can say, yeah, go ahead and line up these faces, things like that, normal sort of Creo assembly methods. And we kind of recommend, you know, you should learn enough about Creo to be decent. You do not have to be a, be a Creo design guru to work this. It's really, I need to assemble some parts in, I may want to build a fixture, like this vice actually came from uh, online Kurt's catalog online, but you can model up anything you want. Same thing for the workpiece. Let's just go ahead and put this inside of a billet. I can, you know, build one on the fly. Let's add some face material here so I can do it that way. Or I could assemble in another Creole model. If I have a casting or a forging, you're perfectly okay to use that as your workpiece. And it's sort of like with that, yeah, that's everything I need to do. So let's start operation 10. I'm going to work here on the top. So let's turn on that same fixture setup. And all I really need to do now is tell it where is machine zero. I don't care how the part was constructed in CAD. I just say, no, I want that corner, for example, to be XYZ zero. So that looks good. Uh, let's go put a retract plane maybe. It's just up off of that. So something like that. All right, so now I'm set up. So now I'm on a program. So how do we program? Well, most operations for starting out here, I'm just going to start with a window. A window is just simply a boundary that says, okay, start on this, go down to, you know, maybe uh, the depth of that protrusion, right? Because I'm just going to face this thing off. And I'm going to give this thing a, a name. I'll call it MW face. And I'll show you why I'm naming that thing in a minute, because that's part of your automation, your reuse. All right. So you can see in the model tree, all these things I'm doing, normal sort of Creo. If I want to edit these things, I can go in and change any of the attributes and so forth, but they're all lined up there. Um, if anybody on here hasn't used any of the latest builds of Creo, uh, three, four, and five, you'll notice all sorts of good pop-up menus. Anytime you hit anything, it instantly gives you, well, you probably want to edit it or play it and so forth. So really cutting down on mouse travel. Like Jim was saying, we put a lot of work in lately and improving efficiency you know it's like okay i can program it now i need to program it really really fast because i got to get this thing out that's part of my job so a lot of that we're setting up all right so let's go ahead and put a tool path on it so if i go to my milling tab you'll see here's all my options roughing facing engraving um, i'll talk about high speed milling here in a second drilling all these different cycles there's lots of obscure ones down here pencil tracing plunge roughing so really a complete uh, cam system. In this case, let's start with the simplest. Let's just say I want to do a face milling operation. Maybe use my one inch flat end mill. It says, what are we going to machine? Well, I want to go get that face. Right? So I'm going to use that guy to do that. So that looks good. And as soon as I have something, it puts a tool path up there. Right? And now I can go change how does it work? Because it's going to make some assumptions of default, you know, step over, step depth, things like that. I can accept those. I can go ahead and start changing and say, no, we're only going to do 50 thousandths because we're cranking up the feed rate, right? Something like that. Or I want to have not just a, a lacing back and forth. I want to have it actually uh, do a arc connect, right? And you'll see all, most all these options I get 
little graphics, tell about the different options, so forth. Same thing, you know, what sort of motion, a spiral motion, a back and forth, one direction. We could spend weeks and weeks on these parameters and bore everybody to tears. We're not going to do that. We're just going to go make toolpaths, right? So that's great. I like that. I play it. Make sure it looks good and all that. You can look at the code. You can position the tool anywhere in here and say, is that right? Make sure that's okay. But if you're happy with it, you're done. Now, the thing is, all of these parts I do, I do those over and over. I do the same sort of thing. So this face milling operation, I like that. I want to keep it. And I want to reuse it on other jobs. Well, how do I build that sort of automation? Well, the answer is I just hit build me a template, right? And so now this template, and I'll name it something like, okay, this is my 6061 face milling, you know, with a one inch end mill. You name it anything, you know, it can be simple. It can be quite complex. It's whatever makes sense to you. It's not a Creo uh, template. It's your template. In this case, it's my face milling, blah, 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 blah. And so now the next time I do something, instead of me picking these options, what I'm going to do is just say, go to my template library and go get something. So for example, let's put a second mill window on here. And I'm going to start it right there. All right. And I'm going to say the depth goes to the bottom of the part. And I really don't have to do that. It basically, it'll do the depth of until I run out of uh, workpiece, but either way, I can do that. Now I'm going to name it something that I did the last time. Remember, I renamed that thing Mill Window Face. Well, when I created that template, it remembered that. So same thing here. If I say MW Outer, and then I go get, for example, my roughing sequence. Right. Rather than me going up here, say roughing, go pick a different strategy, and so forth. It just says, okay, got it. It picked the tool, it picked all my strategies, and it's a tool path. And so now I've got a sort of a high-speed roughing thing. Now, do you like the way it works? Do you wanna change it around? You've got all sorts of different options. You can go through there. You can say, all right, I need a different step over from last time. Uh, I wanna do, instead of a spiral, I wanna do a constant tool load or something like that, what's your step over? But basically you just take it, go from there, right? And you can go back, you can go back and say, oh, that sequence there, yeah, you know, let's get that depth right. You know, I wanna push it, you know, maybe a blind depth and say, I wanna go so far. So you can have options like that, but basically that's it. So all of your tool paths, if you've done it before, rather than each time having to redo them, you just say, go do it. So like these holes here, right? So what is that? That's a center drill, a drill, a uh, counter bore, a couple of different operations. Well, if I've done that before, I'll just say, yeah, go get them, right? So here's my quarter inch, 20 center drill, drill, tap, counter bore, all those different operations. And I can say, play those. Show me what that looks like. Oops, that's a little fast. Hang on, let me rewind it. Right, so it's center drill, drill, counter bore, tap, whatever you need to do. And again, these aren't Creo, they're not PTC templates. They're ones you make them once, store them. And then when you bring them in, what they do is, so like here's my tap 420, if I go back and look at that, you can have it search for, you know, diameters, parameters. In this case, I had it search for quarter 20 screw uh, threads. It found them, put them all in there. So really, really fast. And that's the whole idea is you just keep going. Now I've been playing these tool paths sort of, you know, quick and easy. Um, let's go do, for example, what should we do? Let's do a, um, if I go back to my face milling operation, you know, you saw me do this as a play path. We also have, the idea of solid model simulation that says show it to me as an actual solid. 
And there's all sorts of options. And I can turn on my workpiece to show how that worked. Um, and all of these are just toggles, turn them on and off. I don't want to see the tool path itself, but you can see it actually shows the scallop, shows the steps and so forth. This whole simulation, this is new, uh, either late Creo 3 or Creo 4. So again, if you haven't seen in a while, we've got all sorts of new capabilities. You can do uh, offset comparison. You can do cross sections to take a look at how it looks. There's lots of really neat new tools if you haven't seen that simulation in a while. All right. So we've got, that's going along. Um, let's also, you know, if I wanna drill some holes, for example, you know, these I've got the, these are 370 holes. So we'll go drill all of those guys. So something like that. So now once I've got this, right? So some of this is, this is just pure 3D, you know, cam. It's very, very simple. At any point, I can say spit out the whole operation. Let's go post it and so forth. But what's really nice is what happens when this part changes? What happens when you get that phone call of, hey, something's wrong here. Uh, we need to modify this part. You haven't cut that yet, have you? And what do you do? Well, you say, uh, no, technically we haven't, but, you know, that's kind of, the, you know, are you sure you want to do that? Well, in Creo, you don't have to do that. You just go in, you know, I'm here on this Creo model, right? Any changes I make to this are gonna be adapted by my manufacturing because it's not step, because it's not IGES. I just simply go in, you know, here's that whole pattern, for example. And if I go in here and let's take out some of the pattern, right? I needed to redo this, add some holes, delete some holes. So in the Creo world, right, what could be easier, you just, make your modification, you know, you change the size of this pocket, right? Well, how much do you change it? I change it by five thousandths or something. You know, those are the kind of things that get left off because, oh, somebody forgot to do a uh, an ECN, right? But that pocket is slightly different. Well, all I had to do is change it here in Creo, go back to my manufacturing model, Right, see that whole pattern? Can you see the, the pocket that's changed? No, you can't, but the toolpath knows it. All I have to do is hit regenerate, and then like here are those holes. You know, it knows now there's no holes over there. Don't drill those other ones, leave them off. That's the kind of change that really gets you going is we feel like we're really, really fast to build that toolpath the first time to be able to uh, quickly put everything I need on there, to be able to go in, uh, let's do a quick engraving, for example. So if I say grab a small ball end mill here, what are you gonna engrave? I wanna go engrave that uh, number there, right? So I've got a tool path, it's pretty fast and easy. You know, go machine out, put a little depth on there and so forth, but what happens when that thing changes? You know, what if I, as the manufacturing guy, need to make a change? Well, I can even do that right here. I'm in Creo, right? Even right in here, I can go in and say, yeah, you know that, oh, it shouldn't be 324, it should be 999. So the engineer can do it, and then I simply say, update my model. I can do it right here, and now say, regenerate my model. And what happens? Well your toolpath updates, right? Oops, back to the main thing. So play that toolpath, it knows what to do. That's how you get your parts out by five, you make it to the softball game, you know, more importantly, you get this part out to the customer, you get the new product, the new prototype, and so forth, and you just keep going, keep going, all right? So we could do uh, lots of tool paths. Let me just do one real fast. Uh, one I always like to mention uh, surface machining. So we've kind of done a lot of flat stuff here. So grab a small ball and mill. It says, okay, what do you want to machine? I want to machine that guy so forth. And specifically, I want to start up here and I want to go down here. And 
not just that, I want to do it as one big helical cut. And I'll put, instead of a step over, let's put a small scallop height, something like that. So now just a surface machining. And in this case, three axis. Go polish that whole side there. And again, I just pick on it. Now, if that pocket changes, my pocket changes, you just let it go. And then, uh, this is kind of a really just a two and a half axis, three axis part. I will mention, you know, I can easily change this to be four axis or five axis. So maybe if that draft went the other direction, I'd have to put that around. I can do that. If anybody would like to see some five axis models, I can always call some of those up too. But, but basically, that's it. Say, I like this thing, save this model, you know, let's go ahead and, oop, and regenerate. You know, at any point I can say, play the whole tool path, let it calculate everything together, and run the whole thing. Speed that up a bit, All right? So there's my big roughing operation. And then when I'm happy with that, probably the next step, let's go ahead and run that in the simulation module. So again, you know, there's no translation on my part. I just say, yeah, go do it, right? And you can change the quality of the resolution. Again, you'll set that up based on, you know, what do you care about, so forth. So let's go ahead and show what that looks like. I'll turn off those tool paths and so forth. But here's my, you know, again, constant tool load. Uh, high-speed milling functions. You can turn on gouge check. You know, if, if I run into my fixture, boop, it's going to tell me. Flash it in red, give you a measure, uh, message. Say, hey, you had a you know, collision. Good job, guy. So fix those problems before you ever leave the programming room there. Once you've got it the way you like, obviously, I've still got a few more tool paths. If you clean up, and so forth, you just simply say, okay, let's go post that. So with every seed of Creo and C, we include G post. Let me show you that real fast, show you what that looks like. So this is the module where you build post processors, you create them, you edit them, change them, and use them. And the idea is if you've got a you know a three-axis mill with a Haas controller, a FANUC controller, and so forth, you just Call it up, start with the basic specs, describe what sort of formats you want for the code, how many decimal places, uh, things that you care about, sequence number and so forth. The machine doesn't care, but a lot of people have very specific ideas what they want. You got your start, your stop, you got all your machine codes, how do you do circle statements? So you can walk through this. So let's talk about posts. The idea is you have this software, you can build them yourself, we can bring them in. Uh, 3HDI has consultants come in basically as an implementation package and part of training. They can set all that up. Once you've got them, they're there. So now I've got my post set up. So ready to go do a tool path. I'll just say, let's go ahead and save the CL file for the whole operation and post it out. So give it a name. This is going to be 3356. And I want to go to what machine? So now I've got them all numbered here. Yeah, I'm going to go to that Hosh TM2P. Get a prompt. Yep. And so now I've got a tape file. So just like that, this thing's ready. But just as important, if this part changes, if I have another version of this part, boom, just rerun it, regenerate, spit it out again. And you can change that as many times as you want. If I change the size of this bore, it just goes. All right, so that's the basics. I wanna show a couple of other things. Uh, let me grab another model here. So I was showing all of the milling function. Same sort of thing happens in the turning world. Um, and the same sort of benefits. You know, if this is just a, a pipe, you know, a 2D part, well, I can program it here. I can program it any cam system. I can program it out on the machine just as fast as anything. But if you start getting into these sort of parts where, yeah, we've got, you know, I'm going to drill that out. I'm going to face turn it and so forth. But then, yeah, I've got to 
programmed those holes. We got radio holes for a mill turn center. So I need to be able to do all of that. All these different things, I need to take my mill and cut those flats. I can't turn those, or at least traditionally. So now I've got a end mill and so forth. When you get into that kind of complexity, once you get to different curvatures and so forth, you know, all the different options, I want to rough it with profile passes and so forth and multiple, all of that just makes it so much easier. And same sort of thing. If I change this whole pattern, my drill pattern updates. If I change the size of these flats, right, then my tool path that's milling out those flats is going to go cut those off. So it makes it really, really easy. All right, so that's turning, uh, mill turn. Let's go to one other area. What if you've got a part that looks something like this? All right, so I've got a plastic handlebar cover, right? So I'm not going to machine that out of a piece of plastic. I want to make a mold of it. Well, here's my part. What are you going to do with it? Well, the answer is go into Creo Manufacturing. And in this case, we're going to use the mold extension. I'm going to put that thing inside of a block and then use my mold capabilities for things like shrinkage, parting surfaces, cutouts, molds, and so forth, water lines, runners, so that my end result is not just that part, but parting lines, parting surfaces, and now let's build cores, cavities. So the end result of tool design option is .prt parts, but specifically cores, cavities, and again, this is for injection mold. It could be for a forging, upper and lower die, it could be casting, so cope and drag, whatever you're doing, positive and negative. But it always starts with the design part, just like all the other modules. If that part changes, my mold updates. And then once that is updated, then we've got, of course, I'll take that into the milling package. And so now I'm going to mill that package, right? So I've got my core. Stuck it inside of a workpiece. I could put any kind of fixture. Those are always just optional. But now I'm going to make tool paths to machine this away. And so that's where I want to mention now with Creel 5, we actually have a new application specifically for mold machining here. And the idea is okay, roughing is fine, but people who do this all day, positive and negative, they tend to walk through the same sort of process of rough it, re-rough it, finish it, refinish it, which is all good. But we also want to do that in a very high-speed manner. These days, most people are getting better and better machines that are very accurate at high speed. So what we came out with is basically this tab. This is the biggie. There's lots of little things that are new. But the biggie for Creo 5 is high-speed roughing, high-speed rest roughing. High speed finishing, high speed rest finishing. You know, rest simply meaning, you know, if I say I want a rest finish operation, one of the things I'm going to say is I've already gone over it with a half inch bull nose. Now I want to go over it with a quarter inch. Let's go get what we missed. So this up creates really, really efficient tool paths that are both, they're very fast to calculate here, but they're also fast out on the machine, which is really what you want. I want to be able to rip through this part. So here I'm going to say, I want to rough this, finish it, rest finish it, and I'll just run the whole thing. It basically takes about a minute to calculate and let it go. But that's what's new in Creo 5 is going to be mold machining. Uh, we've got improvements to the simulation package. Uh, we've got improvements to trajectory milling, surface milling, got to rewrite. So we're not stopping. It was just like Jim was saying there. We're going to keep improving this module. And most of it is stuff, it's very much stuff we're writing. It's not like we you know, are licensing a company that does it all for us. We're writing these things. Uh, for the high speed, we actually did license an engine to do the toolpath, but everything is Creo. Everything gets updated. So if you've got a problem with any of these, you call the same PTC support line, call your buddies there at 3HDI, just as you do with Creo, you know, you're going to do the same thing with the machining package.
All right. So that's basically it. That's what I wanted to show. Just a real quick PowerPoint note here. And I actually, I actually need a couple more PowerPoints, don't I? Um, I wanted to mention how they're packaged. So with Creo, all of these are extensions. They're an extension that sits on top of the seat of Creo. And this is our base one, Prismatic Multi-Surface Milling. Oops, wait, wrong, wrong slide. Go back one. Prismatic Multi-Surface Milling. This basically shows you everything I did in that first part. It's full three-axis milling plus four and five-axis indexing. And again, I didn't get into that, but if you're doing tombstone work or just a rotary table where you're indexing, you can. all of that is in the base NC package. It's milling, surface, drill, surfacing, drilling, facing. It includes the simulation, includes the post-processing, everything you need to do parts like that. You can step up to our middle package. It's called production machining. This is everything that's in Prismatic plus turning, single and dual turret, and wire EDM, two and four axis. And then the top level is complete machining extension, which is everything in production milling plus multax milling and mill turn. So turbine blades, mill turn centers with uh, single dual spindles, things like that, all of that's included in complete machining. And again, I need a couple more slides here. So with Creo 5, we also have the extension that's mill, uh, the uh, mold milling. So for cores and cavities and electrodes and so forth, that's specifically an extension. If that's all you do, you can get that one by itself. And then of course, tool design option to, show, to create those molds and so forth. So basically those are the five packages, if you will, that I showed today. And that's what makes up uh, Creo NC. And that's it for me. Uh, we, Rob, we also you? do sheet metal NC, Lee. Uh, we're yeah. not gonna show that today because we, we were trying to keep this to 30 minutes. So you're, you went over about one minute, Lee, but oh, uh, man, I don't I'm care. A failure. There you go. For those for those of you who want to, uh, Lee to do voiceovers on your wedding or your family videos, um, <laughs> call me and I'll give you I'll give you a cell number. Um, Lee has a great TV or radio voice too. Um, no, but call no, me first. Great don't job. Let him cut. <laughs> great you job. Take a cut um, it, so. I I love the simplicity, the automation, the ease of use. Um, uh, I have a lot of success with this product. Um, I just don't think we talk about it enough. I don't think we show it enough. And, um, you know, does anybody have any questions, by the way? If you have questions, you can type them in. Rob will read them off. Um, yeah, one, one, we have a couple of questions that did come in. Uh, so while we're answering these questions, feel free to uh, type those into the dashboard. And uh, one of the questions that came in was, um, can Creo handle a dual spindle mill turn? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So the mill turn, basically, that's in your work center definition. And obviously, I'm here on a, a mill, but I could say, all right, now we're taking this part to a mill turn center. So it can be a mill turn, three, four, five axis, got up to four uh, heads, four uh, turrets, and two spindles. And then once you define, you know, I've got all these different options, you'll notice here in my tooling list, various options do we have milling on head one head two things like that lots of different definitions so that's a, that's a good example of what we've been improving um this whole forehead dual spindle that came about in creo three so uh well, creo two or three somewhere back there recently three uh, yeah three yep. so nice improvements there so yeah good question all right cool um uh, next question is um, you were showing this, uh, showing this in Creo, and the question is, can you uh, use Creo NC Suite on a neutral file or a non-native CAD file like SolidWorks or um, you bet. Katia? Yep. Yeah. So no, great question there. So yeah, I started with a full-blown Creo part here. Basically, almost everything you saw me do today would have worked exactly the same on a step file, a parasolids file, a SOLIDWORKS file, an NX file, all of those operations, everything would have been exactly the same. The, the only exceptions are like when I changed that whole pattern or I edited that P 
piece there. You know, I just went into Creo to make those edits. Now that may be a little more difficult to do with a step file, but the answer is even then you could do it. So like if I went in and just extruded over a bunch of those holes, what I would then do, I'd just come back here, I'd edit my drill cycle and say, oh, take those guys out. You know, or in this case, because I was doing it by diameter, it would have said, hey, there's five fewer holes. It would have even picked that up on a step file. So it's really made for that. It's sort of like the bulk of the, the you know, the fastest possible automation is Creo. But other types of files, no big deal. Absolutely easy. And not only that, Rob, but Creo can edit the files. We can edit a step file. We can edit a SOLIDWORKS mm -hmm. file. We can edit a Katia mm -hmm. file. We can edit a an IGES file. That's the power of Creo. Lee spoke about it early in the demo. We have direct and parametric modeling in Creo. So Creo looks at this as parametric feature based and it also looks at it as a mathematical volume and as such it can modify it. So if you want to change, you want to put draft on a step file or a SOLIDWORKS file, no problem. You want to change something because you have different tools, okay? If you're a machine shop and you know that the radius isn't critical from your customer, you can change it based on your 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 tooling. So this is why Creo is so robust, easy to use, and automated, and very very powerful. But that's a good question. Any others? Yes. Uh, how do you automate the update of the actual turn profile cut line? So basically, the it's going to be the same sort of method. Let me go back to that turn part. So this, so the the caller is asking about how we in turning we use a turn profile, and there's a lot of different ways to define that turn profile. You can simply draw it, you sketch it out, and so forth. But the easiest is to actually use the model itself and then what you do is you say I want you know this portion of it from here to here or I want all of it or I want all of it but notice here I took out that area so what happens is by choosing a fairly automated profile if something happens in the middle let's put somebody puts a groove in here it's going to update it's this is strictly a look at the rotational volume of this part. Now, if I had done it as a sketch, so instead, you know, literally I drew something and I said, I want my turn profile to look like this, right? Well, now whatever happens in here is not going to update. So that's part of the logic and the thinking of what do you want? I can say that this thing is going to leave that much material, right? So now I put a relation, if this flat changes, it, that number is going to change. But if this changes, this isn't going to change. So you start putting in your own smart. So it, the answer to the question is depends on how you build that turn pro profile. But there's a lot of different ways to build them. And by using the really automated, just nope, I want to go from here to here. That's what I want to use. This is going to update anything that happens in the middle. Or even if it doesn't, let's say somebody puts a chamfer on here, all I should have to do is kind of what I did there. I just said, okay, I've got this face profile, this OD profile, let's go edit it. And let's add in that chamfer or something like that. Okay. So, you know, I, I won't tell you it's 100% everything always updates because it depends on how you build it. You might decide, no, I don't want that completely. control of that sketch. One okay. other comment I'll make is that Creo can also get your instructions, your drawings and your instructions and even bill of materials to the shop floor very rapidly. Um, we often overlook that. We're so excited about this functionality, but just getting your, your proper instructions out to the to the work to the shop floor or the specific work center. So Lee uh, pulled down and he said, hey, we have this work center. You can have machine specific instructions at every work center, 
okay, generated from Creo. This is, this is something that people, like, they pull their hair out over, and it's done automatically. How do you do that in a CAM, in a CAM product? Okay, you don't. You don't. So um, this is not CAD CAM. This is designed through manufacturing automation. That's why Creo is different. It's not CAD CAM. You're right. It's designed through manufacturing automation with the CAD and the CAM built in. Any other questions, Rob? Yes. Uh, next question is, uh, thanks for the webinar. Great explanation. Simple, highly neglected in my company. Don't recall having seen loading material description and any type of tooling used for the system to calculate the speeds and feeds. Good point. Yeah, I really didn't even talk about the cutting tools here. Let's do, <laughs> let's do that real quick. So um, first, let's mention you did see me use some like solid tools and, you know, things like here's a cutoff tool and so forth. We also use things like parameter tools. I can just say I need a, you know, a wing cutter and so forth. The idea is tools can be solid. They can be ones that I draw up, simple ones. They can be ones I download from Kinemetal or Sandvik or any of those people. They all have CAD models and most of their stuff. I can bring those in. And then I can also just simply give parameters, right? What does this thing look like with this parameter? Any of that and all of that is, is okay. And then for each tool, you can store cut data, roughing, finishing, you know, speed, speeds, depths, and so forth, and for a various bunch of material. So the idea is there's a lot of ways to achieve what you asked for. So if I told it my work piece, which I did in the first cut, first round, I didn't even tell it what kind of material it is. I just said, go do it. But if I told it I was aluminum 6061 and I have such and such feed rate, it will go ahead and put those in as defaults. So same thing I kind of mentioned at the beginning. You do it once, store it over and over. Now, the other way to do that is when I use those templates, right? When I said, go get my 750 button face turn template. Well, I could have one of those templates for steel, one for aluminum, one for cast iron, whatever you do, one for plastic, and then have four different templates. So I grab the material and the starting feeds and speeds that way. So, and then the final option is you can also just kind of set up defaults. So here's, you know, for my standard drilling, these are, I always want to start with a peck depth of half the cutter diameter. So it's sort of in lieu of any other information, I have these kind of de uh, default things that I have set up kind of per work center is the most common or more work center style, if you will, you know, Clearance distance, start with 100,000. So you can set those up to have your way. So, so again, back to it, you do it once and then just store it over and over. So if I tell it what kind of material I'm working on in here, it's gonna go grab those values from the tooling list. If they're there, if it doesn't, it sees a site file that says, eh, start with this default. And then I just go into each particular sequence and say, yep, change it around. So. Depending, kind of depends on just how automated you are in your shop. Most people tend to have, yeah, I start with these. And then you just go in and tweak each job there. And that's fine. We'll support that environment. So, yeah, good question. I, I really passed over the cutting tools that we should have talked about that. Cool. Next question is, how does Creo allow for probe programming? So it basically, um, I'm going to go in and say I want to do a manual cycle. And that manual cycle, actually, let me just go grab one that's got all that. I was just working with one of those. If I can find it real fast. Do, 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 do. Oh, what logical, smart thing did I put that under? Wonder if it's over. Shoot, where did I put that? I put it somewhere smart. All right, let me just go back to our job here. 
So the answer is I can go in and put in a tool, a probe, and then when I go here, I'm going to say, all right, I want to start my probe cycles. So we have predefined apt probe cycles of points, corners, boss, slots, webs, and so forth. And so you can go in and put these kind of commands. So if I say I want a bore of certain diameter and so forth, I'm going to probe it at five inches per minute. I need to put in the offset number and so forth, clearance value and so forth. And then it builds the probe statement, right? And then so I'll follow that with a go to point. And I'm going to just put a point. And again, I'm doing this really fast, but you'll get the idea. Oops. Come in. Let me locate that there and that there. Okay. All right. So now I've told it I've got some points. I want to go to that one. And so now my cycle, and again, I didn't grab, I don't have a probe here. I've got a model somewhere that has all that, but it's basically. Go to that point, here's the verify statement, and then go do that particular probing operation. Uh, so this assumes something like, you know, a Renishaw probe and so forth, and basically the post is gonna turn this into whatever sort of MNG code file your particular machines. Uh, there seems to be no industry standard, so there's always a bit of post-processor working to go do that, but these are the commands. And, you know, as you saw there, got all these different cycles of boss, bore, slot, web, X surface, just inside corner, outside corner, you can do any of those. And then all the different parameters that go up with that. Um, we also have uh, probe setup. So it's the, you know, just turn probe on, do a scan, a range. So if you want to set how far, all of those are standard apt words for probing, and you can go do it. And if I had the slightest idea where I put that, this is like two weeks ago, so obviously I'm getting old and stupid here. I'm looking in my hard drive here, made up a whole model there. Oh, I know where that is. There we go. Do, 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 do. There we go. All right, so same sort of thing here. So now uh, I, I brought in, instead of a tool, basically just a probe, right? And so go probe that boss, probe that outside corner, probe that slot, and all of those come out as app statements. So, And it's basically you do a go-to point, uh, a clearance, some sort of safety point, put in the probe statement, tell it what you're probing, and for things like a boss and so forth, you probe a center point, just a point at the center, and then give it a depth. And then you go get it. Okay, I think my, oh, I don't have that probe in the right directory, but that's the idea. It's basically doing that way. We also have a second operation or a different method that's kind of newer, more high-tech stuff I'll mention real quick because you can actually, oops, so say that your machine has, oh, do, 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 oh, there it is right there in front of me. And if I say enable probing, well, now I actually get the full boat uh, CMM options here. So these are going to, instead of app, these are going to output DEMA statements. So if, if your machine can handle DEMA statements or you write a translator there, we have a module called uh, Creo CMM that basically does full-blown offline CMM programming. I just turned that whole capability on inside of my toolpath. So again, most people don't have Demus capability yet, but there's some that are coming out and we're ready to go for it. Uh, Lee, you've been around too long. It's called Creo Veri Verification. Sorry. We had to change, <laughs> to, we had to change it the module. It used to be called Pro -E CMM, but yep. you're right. Nonetheless, awesome. Any other questions, Rob? Uh, one more question: How do you bring in? How do you bring in downloaded cutting tools into Creo? So anybody who'd like to, I can send you a little PowerPoint on that. 
But the answer is, let me just open one up. Um, yeah, oh, there's a perfect example. So like this guy. So this one, I'm pretty sure was a Sandvik piece. And I went to their library online and they had a, I think these were step files. Let me look. Yeah, so these are just imported features. So I downloaded their step model. I put them, turned them into pretty colors. I named them something useful. Then you go in and do a couple of very specific things. You put a coordinate system actually in the model. You name it TIP, T-I-P, and you point it in the appropriate direction for a turn tool in the standard turning orientation. So I put that coordinate system there. That tells Creon see how to move it around when I'm displaying it, so forth. You also go into your parameters, and you give it tooling parameters, and this is sort of as needed for a given type of tool. So for a groove turning tool, I need a nose radius, side angle, end angle, tool width, and a length. And then a uh, tool type, and this is tool type turn grooving. So, so the answer to your question is actually a 30 minute discussion uh, because there's a little bit of work there, but we can help you do that. Um, but the short answer is you put a tip, you put these parameters that are appropriate for that type of tool, and then it sees it. So it's basically a little setup work for a given type of tool. But almost always, I find uh, there's a couple of companies that even have old, you know, Pro E models of them, and even still, you kind of have to do this same sort of work. So, so I don't, I don't mind whether it's Step or Creo or Parasolids or anything. I just bring it in, put these in, and so forth. So, and again, uh, if anybody'd like to, I can send you a PowerPoint on how to do that. So, just talk to your local 3HDI guy, and he will fix you up. Absolutely. So uh, I guess what we'll do is we'll have some closing comments right now. Uh, Jim, anything to add? Uh, great job, Lee. Uh, I think the the solution, and that's what I'll call it, speaks for itself. Um, uh, it's very easy to use. Uh, we don't care where you're starting from, if it's Creo or another CAD tool. Um, if you're in-house, if you have in-house machining and you're using Creo, to me, this is, I hate to use the term, but I'm going to use it. It's a no-brainer. Um, the, the degree of automation you get with, with Creo is unparalleled in our industry. And uh, Lee and I started, I think, within a couple weeks of each other 24 years ago back at PTC. And I haven't seen anything like it since. Um, uh, you know, automation, automation, automation. Is, is what customers really are striving for, whether they're saying it or not. And this is what we're seeing. And I've had great success with this tool. And, um, you know, we have a lot of participants in this webinar today. And I'm very excited to get introduce a lot more people to this solution. That's my closing comments. Thank you, Lee. Cool. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Jim. And uh, thanks. Thank our audience for being on today. Uh, I will send out a recording of the webinar to everybody, and if you have any uh, questions, just feel free to respond to the emails that you received from LogMeIn um, concerning your registration link and updates for the webinar. If you respond to those, I will receive those emails, and uh, I will forward, forward those accordingly and be able to uh, get your questions answered. So once again, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Lee Goodwin, and thank you, our audience, for being on today. Enjoy the enjoy the day enjoy and have it. a great weekend. We're dismissed. Thanks, everyone. Take care, everyone.